Good morning. I feel almost guilty interrupting the hubbub of conversation that's going on, but I do pray that we'd all, that the um, time of fellowship would continue. Just to remind you, we have a meal after the service this morning, so you can continue your conversations and fellowship there. Um, before we start, I'd just like to thank Ali from um, Grace Church in Brockley for coming along and stepping in as a pianist this morning, as otherwise we are bereft of musicians. Anyway, we're going to, I'm just going to uh, read a verse from the Bible and then we're going to stand and sing. And the verse comes from the passage we're considering today from Luke chapter 1. And it's the angel's words to Mary. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you would call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forevermore. His kingdom shall never end. We're going to stand to sing, Hail to the Lord's anointed. And indeed, it's Hail to the Lord's anointed. Great David's greater son, echoing the words of that verse. So let's stand to sing. now commit the service to the Lord in prayer and Lord and Father as we think on those verses we again give you thanks for our Lord Jesus that he is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords his kingdom will never end Lord we just thank you for that prophecy and promise Lord about the, the magnificence the supremacy of Jesus. And we pray that this morning, Lord, 
we will come to a better understanding of the importance of Jesus to each and every one of us. That we would get a better understanding of our need of Jesus, the most important thing that we can ever do to accept Jesus as our Lord and Saviour. So, Lord, we do pray that you would be working among us this morning, that you would open our hearts to the message, but in particular, Lord, that our hearts would be open to the Lord Jesus. We do commit this time into your hands, Lord, and at the same time, we do pray for those who aren't with us at this time, those who are unwell. We think of Fiona, who's not well at the moment, Lord. Pray for her, that you'd, you'd speed her recovery. We think of Doug and Olive, Lord. We commit them into your hands. But at the same time, Lord, we're reminded that we are just a small part of your glorious kingdom on this earth. And we do, Lord, at this time, as we come together, pray for our brothers and sisters throughout the world. Many will be joining together in fellowship today to worship you and to bring you praise. We particularly, Lord, at this time, remember those we are closely associated with, particularly thinking of that church in Burkina Faso with the, the problems that beset that land. We pray, Lord, that they might this, today be a real light and a testimony in that land. And Lord, we think of those who are believers but are under persecution. Lord, we do pray for them. We think particularly of the church in China at this time, Lord, where there, are, there is often so much persecution or, or where the church has to meet in secret, in, in constant peril. Lord, we pray for them that you would keep them safe and that they would be encouraged. And Lord, we just thank you that we are part of this great worldwide body. Sometimes we can feel quite alone, but we thank you that we are conscious. We know of the promise that where two or three are gathered together, the Lord Jesus is among us. And again, Lord, as we we commit this time to you. We pray that we might be conscious of the Lord Jesus among us this morning. So, Lord, we commend this time into our hands in, the name, in his name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing another song. Well, the first songs are Advent. You see, as we're looking forward at this time to Christmas, we, we're working through the, the account in the book of Luke about the, the coming of the Lord Jesus. And this is another, another hymn from the squalor of a humble sa stable. A borrowed stable, sorry, I, my memory failed me. Anyway, we're going to stand and sing again.
please do sit down. And Susan is now going to come and read today's passage to us. So the reading this morning is from Luke chapter 1, verse 26 to 38. And that's on page 1026 in the Church Bibles. Luke chapter 1, starting at verse 26. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. Thank you, Susan. Again, that passage, he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. We're going to stand again and sing Jesus, the name high over all. And it's so important to remember this, that Jesus is the very focus of our worship. So let us stand to sing.
It's time for the notices and church family news. Um, I'd like to, well, first of all, start off again welcoming everyone here, particularly those online. I forgot to welcome you earlier on, so you're just as welcome here. We have a number of people online again this morning. Um, also, to thank those, you'll notice that the church has been decorated, getting us ready for Christmas. Um, and they have, the people have been labouring hard. I even myself cut a few lengths of wire to assist the, um, the, 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 the application of baubles to decorations. So I really feel I've made my contributions to the church decorations. But thank you to all of those who came in this morning early on and did that. Which brings me on to the fact that, you know, I'm sure you've noticed we are in the run-up to Christmas um, and we have some leaflets available promoting our services over the Christmas period, starting next week with <clears throat> an all-age craft and carol service on starting at 5 o'clock next Sunday evening, carols by candlelight the following Sunday at 6.30, and of course, uh, Christmas Day, we'll have a service. What we would like, is we would like to distribute as many of these leaflets as possible in the surrounding area. If everyone would just take one road, just some leaflets from one road, it will only take probably 15, 20 minutes to deliver them. Of course, if it's left to three, pe three or four people, it takes an awful lot longer. So could I encourage everyone to perhaps come along, just take a few leaflets. You can sign up at the back for those, take some leaflets and deliver them to the local roads. And while I'm on the subject of leaflets at the back, we also have Christmas cards to various people who are no, we're associated with but are no longer with us. So and if you could add your name to those, it's nice to send those out to people. Coming back to the more local notices, um, this morning Michael is going to be speaking on the passage that was just, has just been read, <coughs> read to us. So I'm losing my voice very slowly to us. And then this evening, we'll ha having, having the last of our current series in Jeremiah. We, we haven't finished the book of Jeremiah, but we've got to a very convenient break point. So please do come along for that. It's been a very enjoyable time. <clears throat> Tuesday morning at 10, we have a Bible study online. Tuesday evening, it's the first Tuesday of the month, and we have a prayer meeting online at 8 o'clock. So please do come along. That's very important to pray for the church, particularly as we're coming up to the Christmas period. And then on Wednesday, at starting at 7.30 with a meal, and then 8 o'clock, there's a Bible study at Michael's house. If you want details of any more of these, please come and talk to 
to me afterwards. And one final notice, I'm just about to do the next instalment of The Road to Honour Oak, our look at the development of church history and how the gospel came, how we came to be here now. Um, and I've mentioned John Wycliffe, and indeed last week I mentioned Wycliffe Bible translators. On the notice board at the back, <clears throat> Susan has put up a display concerning Wycliffe Bible translators. So please do go <coughs> and have a look at that after the service has finished. And again, to remind you, we will have tea and coffee after the service, immediately after the service, and then please stay around because we'll be having a church meal. Right, as long as my voice holds out, i now like to talk about the next instalment of the God's great plan of salvation, the road to honour Oak. And Philip, we have the first slide up. Keston Ponds. Don't know if any of you have been there. Um, Jean Tucker, who's online this morning, actually lives very close to Keston Ponds. And on occasions, we've had our Christmas or our Boxing Day walk parking in the car park at Keston Ponds. And if you go up from that car park, next slide, Philip, you go up through the woods on a path veering to the left, you cross over the road onto another path, and shortly you come to a stone bench. And on that bench there is a quote from the diary of William Wilberforce. At length, I well remember after a conversation with Mr. Pitt in the open air at the root of an old tree at Hol Holwood, just above the steep descent into the Vale of Keston, I resolved to give notice on a fit occasion in the House of Commons of my intention to bring forward the abolition of the slave trade. William Wilberforce was born in Hull, and we won't hold that against him. Hull is actually quite a nice town. John Newton, who was a former slave trader, but was then converted, John Newton, who wrote the hymn Amazing Grace, was a family friend and was hugely... <coughs> And he was hugely influential with Wilberforce. In fact, so influential that his mother took Wilberforce away, put him into boarding school, so that he was, he, she was concerned about the influence that John Newton had on him. And he drifted away from the Lord. He went to Cambridge University, where he made, his, his, I mean, he made a very close friend with William Pitt, who was subsequently to become William Pitt the, known as William Pitt the Younger, one of our better prime ministers. That's not hard, actually. <laughs> um, Wilberforce became a Member of Parliament for Yorkshire, which he's, he was Member of Parliament for Yorkshire for many, many years. But during a journey to the south of France, he was convicted to, to think much more about the Lord. He came back and he sought out John Newton and having this newfound faith, he wanted to devote himself to the Lord's service. But Newton urged him to stay in politics, believing that God may have raised him up for a purpose. Now, as I said, Newton was a former slave trader who was now a strong strongly committed to abolishing the slave trade. Um, now, let me just say a little bit about the slave trade. There's always been slavery. If you look in the Bible, you will see, numerous, particularly in the Old Testament, numerous yeah, references to slaves. In fact, the, the people of Israel themselves were slaves in Egypt. But what happened in the 18th century was with the development of the, the colonial empires, slave trading became industrialised. It was a horrendous trade. There was a triangular trade. Slaves were purchased <clears throat> on the west coast of Africa, transported on, in terrible conditions on boats to the Caribbean and North and South America. 
Sugar and tobacco and cotton were then brought to ports in Europe, notably in this country, Liverpool and Bristol. And then manufactured goods were then taken down to Africa to, again, purchase more slaves. So the, this triangular trade. The slaves were abysmally treated. The mortality rate, <coughs> the mortality rate on, the, on the voyages alone was horrendous. Um, and there were those who felt that this trade was wrong. And Wilberforce, um, if, as you could next picture, uh, Wilberforce was horrified by the trade and resolved to use his position in Parliament to seek its abolition. And that's when he met with William Pitt and told him about, who was then the Prime Minister, told him about his intention to introduce a bill <coughs> for the abolition of slavery. And in 1789, he made his first great speech in Parliament. Um, the un <coughs> Unfortunately, the outbreak of the French Revolution and the subsequent War of France distracted Pitt. Um, but nonetheless, there was quite a strong body of support. Indeed, the last letter that John Wesley ever wrote was to William Wilberforce, encouraging him to continue with his campaign to abolish slavery. Um, after Pitt's death in 1806, a new opportunity arose to promote the abolition of slavery. Um, and in 1807, the House of Commons voted for the abolition of the slave trade, and indeed, to outlaw the slave trade in, across the whole of the British Empire. And indeed, Britain then used its diplomatic influence to press other countries into pre treaties to ban the slave trade. And indeed, the Royal Navy was given the mandate to stop slaves, <coughs> to interdict or to stop slave trips sailing under their national flags. Wilberforce, so, but of course, slave, there were still slaves operate, working in plantations. And Wilberforce continued not only, <coughs> not only to ban the slave trade, but the whole, <coughs> oh, sorry, the whole practice of using slaves was to be banned. And he made his final speech in April 1833. The following month, the government introduced the bill for the abolition of slavery, so ab abolishing slavery throughout the British Empire, that by then the greatest colonial empire in the world. And on the 26th of July, Wilberforce heard of government concessions guaranteeing the passing of the bill. And the following day, he grew weaker and died. Wilberforce was driven by his Christian faith. Um, can we have the next slides? And indeed, it was very much the book of Philemon, um, which was written to someone concerning a runaway slave, very much influenced him, and the next slide. And there were also other passages in Corinthians. We we're all baptised by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jew <coughs> or Gentile, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. He, Wilberforce, believed that under God, all men are equal. Not only that, he was a he promoted, he wanted to make sure that improved the lot of people. And indeed, he inspired others. Um, he, was I would say, he was driven by his Christian faith, but others followed his example. Elizabeth Fry was a major driving force behind new legislation to improve the treatment of prisoners, particularly female inmates in prison. The Earl of Shaftesbury, another eminent Christian, was a social reformer, and he campaigned for better working conditions, reform to lunacy laws, education, and in particular, the limitation of child, uh, child labour, particularly the practice of using young, very young children to go up chimneys to clean them, among others. So Christians 
had a great influence. And of course, even today, we should be inspired by these people to support <coughs> causes for injustice, in particular things like open doors. It, just because these reforms have taken place doesn't mean that we are still not responsible for looking after those around us. Well, we're going to sing once more. Um, <clears throat> light of the world. And indeed we, Jesus is the light in our lives, but we too should be lights to the world. Let's all stand to sing. Wonderful. Let's uh, sit down. Great to sing that. Um, it's time now for those in the Explorers group, those are roughly 3s to 11s. It's time to head to uh, your group. You're going to be exploring the Bible together. I think you're doing something on a Christmas in, uh, theme this morning. And um, the rest of us are going to be in that passage that Susan read for us earlier. So if you've not got a Bible to hand, you might like to grab one. Um, there's some at the back there. If anyone's back, they could pan them out. Uh, and there's all a little sheet showing where we're going. So if you want a little sheet, I haven't got one. Again, give them a wave. And I'm uh, sure... Oh, thanks, Philip. We'll sort you out. Let me also add my welcome to those online. Great to have you with us this morning. Uh, great that you're able to join us that way. Thank you to George for pressing on with his voice uh, uh, disappearing off. Hope you're feeling better soon as well. Well, let's, uh, let's pray, shall we, and ask for the Lord's help, particularly for this part of our our meeting. Father God, we do particularly pray that as we come now to think on your word, that you'll speak to us through your word by your Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray that these words might shape our thinking and our attitudes, that you'll give us a heart that is ready to receive your word and respond rightly to it. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, if you know somebody who's had a baby recently, you may have been invited to a gender reveal party. Has anyone been to a gender reveal party? One or two? No, no, it's been a bit shy. Maybe you have, but they're, they're all the rage at the moment. Uh, the idea is that a couple who are expecting a baby uh, find out whether the baby's a boy or a girl, but don't tell people straight away. Instead, they wait, and um, uh, then they have a big party, invite all their friends and family over, and then they announce it in some exciting fashion uh, whether the baby's a boy or a girl. So maybe they might have a cake, and you cut into the cake, and the inside of the cake is blue. Or you've got a big box, and you break open the box, and sort of pink balloons kind of you know, launch out of the box or whether it might be. Now, I guess it's quite a fun reason to get together your friends and family for a party. You know, it's fair enough. You know, why not? Um, but really, I guess for most people, the information they gain there isn't life-changing. You know, it might slightly affect your choice of gift, perhaps, for the baby when they're born. But I guess you could wait for that anyway. You know, it's fun. It's that this pre-birth revelation might be quite fun, but it's not all that vital. Now, in contrast, our Bible, in our Bible account today, we've got a pre-birth revelation that's actually of vital importance. Something that even now, 2,000 years later, we need to listen to and respond to. Uh, the mother in our Bible account is told the gender, gender of the coming baby, but unlike with gender reveal parties, she's not actually even pregnant yet. And she learns an awful lot more than just the gender of the baby. She learns the identity, the role that that baby is going to have, an identity that will change the world. This pre-birth revelation tells us this coming baby boy will be the promised saviour, the forever king, the son of God. What Mary told, uh, was told then by the angel is just as vital for us to hear and accept and respond to today as it was for her to hear back then. So let's turn and look at our passage. Now the first part is an announcement. The announcement, a son is promised. Now if you're with us last week, we saw how the angel Gabriel promised a son to a, a couple called Zachariah and Elizabeth. They were an older couple who didn't think they were ever going to have children. Uh, they were godly but childless. But they were promised this baby who would then grow up and be John the Baptist. And today's account happens when Elizabeth is in the sixth month of her pregnancy. That's the sixth month referred to in the first verse there in verse 26. And in this uh, sixth month of that pregnancy, God again sends Gabriel, the angel, to a, a woman, this time to a young woman called Mary. She lived in the small town of Nazareth, uh, not far from the capital in Jerusalem. Uh, sorry, quite a long way from the capital in Jerusalem, sorry. So it wasn't a particularly well-known town. It was some distance from the capital. It was a kind of small little place, Nazareth. We're told about her in verse uh, 27 there. She was a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. So Mary was unmarried. She'd never slept with a man. But she was pledged to be married uh, to this chap called Joseph. And we're told that Joseph is a descendant of King David. King David was a great king that ruled over God's people uh, more in nearly a thousand years before this. And that's a hint of what's going to come later. So the mention here of David sets us up for what's coming in a minute. She was, a, as far as we can tell, an ordinary young woman in a quiet, kind of out-of-the-way sort of town. But God had a special plan for her. The angel tells her that she is highly favoured, that the Lord is with you. And initially, Mary was a bit worried about that. She's troubled by the angel's greeting, doesn't really know what to make of it. But then the angel gives her this amazing message. To start with, a son is promised. I look in verse 30. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You'll give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. The angel promises Mary a son. And it reminds us of the occasions in the Old Testament 
when God promises certain people that they're going to have a son. And often it's when God is about to do a sort of special work in uh, his purposes. So we see that, for example, with Abraham and Sarah, when Isaac is conceived. So now it's beforehand and there's special work that God is doing. Or with Hannah and her husband, when Hannah conceives and then the prophet Samuel is born. We saw something similar earlier in Luke with Zechariah and Elizabeth and uh, John being conceived. But what God's going to do this time is even more amazing. For Mary will conceive, even though she's unmarried, even though she's never slept with a man. The baby will not be conceived through the normal means. This is an even greater miracle than other special births in the Bible. It's one that points to the surpassing greatness of this baby and what he's going to come to do. So let's look at the identity, shall we, of this promised son. First, we'll see that he's called Jesus. He's called Jesus. In the Bible, often names are very important. Today, parents tend to choose a name because they kind of like the sound of it. So I had a quick look on the internet. Um, This year's most popular girls' names, for example, are Lily, Sophia, Olivia, Amelia, and Ava. So there are the most popular girls' names this year. And usually parents choose a name because they like it. That's what we tend to do today. But in the Bible, often names have a special significance. And especially if that name is chosen by God. And the name Jesus here is the same as the Old Testament name Joshua. If you know something of the Old Testament story, you might know that Joshua was a great leader of God's people. He followed on from Moses And he took God's people in to take possession of what God had promised them, the promised land. They went in to take possession of what God had given to them. And Jesus, this new Joshua, is of course also going to be a great leader of God's people. Indeed, an even greater leader. And he'll lead God's people to take possession, again, of what God has promised them. Something even greater than a physical land. The salvation that God has promised. That fits with what his name means. The name Joshua or Jesus means uh, the Lord saves or Yahweh saves. The baby will be called Jesus because the Lord saves, God saves. This baby is a saviour. Of course, that's exactly what we see in the story of Jesus as it continues. We see how he came to save people. How he rescues people like me and you from sin and death and God's just judgment by his death in our place. Jesus rescues people to be with him forever. He is the saviour. So he's called Jesus, which means saviour. We also see that he's the son of God. So verse 32, he will be great and will be called the son of the most high. This baby is going to be great will be called Son of the Most High. It's another way of saying Son of God. And that's one of those great titles that has sort of layers of meaning. In the Old Testament, sometimes the king of God's people might be referred to as being God's son. And at one level, that's what we're being told here, that um, this baby is going to be this kind of great promised king, the Messiah or the Christ, this special king promised by God. But I think we can also see indications, even in this passage, that Jesus is going to be the Son of God in a much greater and more amazing way, a fuller and deeper way, that he's going to be the fully divine Son of God. Later in this passage, when Mary wants to know how she'll conceive a child without a human father, the angel explains in verse 35, the Holy Spirit will come upon you And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. This child is going to be conceived by the Holy Spirit. This implies that Jesus is going to be more than just a normal human child. Yes, he'll be truly human. But this unique conception by the power of the Holy Spirit shows us that he's going to be more than that. He's going to be the Son of God in the deepest and fullest sense. 
that he is indeed God, eternally Son of God, the Father. Something we see confirmed through the rest of the Gospel account, through the rest of the New Testament. Jesus is the Son of God, both in the sense of being God's promised King, but also in the sense that he is God the Son. He's truly God the Son. And surely that should shape massively how we respond to him. We can't just treat him as a sort of another religious figure, can we? You know, certainly there might be people we might read and think, oh, they're really helpful. Uh, you know, they're the best of, of men or women, we might think of someone. But Jesus is so much more than that. If he is really the Son of God, the only way we can respond to him surely is in worship and praise and then in seeking to follow him in, in obedience. He is the Son of God. He's also the promised king who's going to reign forever. Now, long before this in the Bible, God had promised King David, who we mentioned before, that his family and his line of kings would continue forever. That his throne would continue forever. And through the Old Testament, it becomes clear that this means that there'll be a king who would live forever. But on the day when Gabriel speaks these words to Mary, there's not been any king uh, from David's line on the throne for nearly 600 years. But now the angel tells Mary how her baby will fulfill God's great promises. The great promises are they forever king. Have a look at the end of verse 32 onwards. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Jesus descended on in his earthly line from David. He's going to reign over God's people. God's promises of the king will be fulfilled in Jesus. And he will reign. Now, we've already mentioned uh, King David. He was a great king of God's people. And then he had a son called Solomon who was um, also at least sometimes a good king. Um, but after Solomon died, uh, the kingdom split. Only a fairly small amount of the people of Israel followed the king of David's line, followed Solomon's son, a chap called Rehoboam. Most of them went off and followed another king and did something different. What we're told here, did you notice, is that Jesus is going to be king over the house of Jacob. Now, Jacob's another name for Israel, for the person called Israel. And all of the people of God in the Old Testament come from his line. All the 12 tribes come from his 12 sons. So by saying that Jesus is going to rule over the house of Jacob, it's a way of saying he's going to rule over all of God's people. Not just a little bit of God's people, all of God's people. He's going to be the great king over all the people of God. That kind of reminds us a bit of what we've been seeing in Ephesians. If you if you're with us in the previous weeks when we were in the book of Ephesians, we saw how there's one people of God under the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's, again, the same picture we see here, one people of God under Christ. Not only that, he is going to reign forever. He's going to reign forever. Now, one thing we know with certainty is that all kings and queens die. This year we've seen the passing, haven't we, of Queen Elizabeth of a well-respected and long-reigning queen. But eventually, she too died, just like all the other kings and queens and leaders in history. If you ever uh, learnt kings and queens of England or something like that at school, one thing they all have in common is that they all die. Of course they do. But that's not the case with Jesus. He's not going to stop reigning because he's died, because he dies and then rises again, he defeats death. Wonderfully, amazingly, Jesus dies, rises again to live forever, so he can reign forever. If we follow Jesus, we're not following a dead person from history. We're following a living king, a living king. He is the promised king who reigns forever. Now, most people enjoy meeting babies. I don't know if that's you, and there probably are exceptions, but most people enjoy meeting babies. I certainly enjoyed 
meeting my great nephew recently. That was quite fun. Got another great nephew on the way, so I'm looking, looking forward to that. And if you're not the parent, meeting babies is usually not very demanding. You know, they pass you the baby, you sort of smile at them, you sort of coo at them, you know, make funny noises. And then when they cry, you sort of hand them back to their parents as to look after them. So um, if you're not the parent, small babies are fun, they're nice, but they're not very demanding. Other people's babies, fun to meet, don't demand very much from you. But this baby is very different. His identity means we can't just sort of move on and sort of hand him back, as it were. He is Jesus. He is the Savior. He is the Son of God. He's this promised King who reigns forever. If that's true, we can't just sort of you know, pass him back. The only proper response can be one of trust and worship and obedience. To praise him and live for him. If we believe what the angel says here, surely that must be our response. Anything less than that is rebellion against God, isn't it? We might rebel very quietly by just sort of quietly ignoring Jesus or what he says, but it's still rebellion against our great king. What about you? How do you respond to Jesus? Do you like him for a time? Perhaps you like him on Sundays, maybe you like him at Christmas, but you know, then you sort of hand him back, don't want anything to do with him the rest of the week or the rest of the year, perhaps. You don't want him demanding anything of us. You know, we like the baby, we like the baby in the manger, we like the Christmas carols, but we want to hand him back after that. But if we actually believe these words, we can't do that, can we? We have to come to him in worship, with a desire to trust him and follow him. So, we've seen so far, we've seen the announcement, a, a son is promised, and then we get the response that follows. We see here Mary's response, a model response in, in, in many, many ways. I am the Lord's servant. Now, Mary starts with a question in her response there in verse 34. It's not a question of doubt, it's a question of understanding. Verse 34, how will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? Mary understands where babies come from. She understands that. So she wonders how she's going to be able to have a baby without a human father. Yeah, she understands the, how these things work. And the angel responds, Mary's not going to conceive in the way that every other pregnant woman throughout the history of uh, the world has conceived. She's going to conceive the baby in a unique way, enabled by the Holy Spirit. I'll look at verse um, 35 again. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called Son of God. This will be a unique virgin conception. And it fits with Jesus' unique identity, doesn't it? He's truly man and truly God. His unique conception points to that. That he is the son of God. He's the one who is truly God, as well as being truly man. So he must surely have something unique about his conception, which is what we see here. Also, the baby, we're told, is going to be holy. It's going to be set apart for God. I think this points us towards another reason for Jesus' unique conception. One well, the people have reflected on over the years uh, since. God's direct involvement in this conception breaks that pattern of sin passed down from generation to generation to generation. Because from the time of our first uh, fathers and mothers, from Adam and Eve onwards, from their sin, everyone has been born as a sinner. Everyone has a fallen nature, and uh, we inherited that from our parents, and then we embrace it, we live it out in our lives. Everyone starts their life, continues their life in this way, except, that is, for Jesus. He is born holy. Jesus is sinless throughout his life. He has a real human nature, but not a, a fallen, sinful one. He doesn't have that fallen, sinful nature passed on by his parents. 
His conception was unique by the Holy Spirit. And that's vital because it means that Jesus can be the saviour that we need. If we're going to be rescued, we need Jesus to be sinless, to be a, a sacrifice without sin. And that's enabled by who he is, even his conception. He is holy and sinless from his birth. The angel reassures Mary with a sign. He, he, he points out that her older and childless, previously childless relative, Elizabeth, someone who's never been able to have children in the past and now in her older age, well, she's now expecting a son. It's a sign to Mary that God can also do for her what he has promised. Now, of course, we might say, well, the things that the angel says here are impossible, aren't they? We know they're impossible. Well, yes, they are impossible from a human point of view. But the angel reassures them, he reassures Mary, perhaps therefore through her it reassures us, that God can and does and will do this. Verse 37, for nothing is impossible with God. The Bible contains many things that are impossible for people on our own. Many miracles, many acts that, we could, that people of our own abilities could never do. But the point is that God can do them. God can do things that are humanly impossible. Nothing is impossible with God. What a reassurance that is. When we read God's promises to know that nothing is impossible for God, he will do what he has promised. He will achieve what he said. Nothing is impossible with God. And Mary's response is a model response for us, isn't it, there in verse 38? I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you had said. Mary trusts God. And, the way, and she expresses her commitment to therefore follow the path that God has laid out for her. Now, if you can imagine it, that must have been very hard for Mary. She was a, a young woman. She's going to get pregnant under circumstances that other people aren't going to understand. Um, you can imagine the sort of things that other people might say to her in these situations. But she chooses that she wants to live and embrace the way that God has for her. I am the Lord's servant. Last time we saw that Zachariah was disciplined for not trusting God's word to him through the angel. But here Mary believes what God says and commits herself to doing it. She gladly fulfills that role that God has given her. And I guess, again, that challenges us, doesn't it? What about us? Are we willing to submit ourselves to what God wants for us, his instructions for us, what he says that we uh, should do, how we should be his people? Now, I know that in life that sometimes there are decisions that are tricky. Occasionally we come across a situation and deciding the right thing to do in that situation is tricky. That does happen. But actually, in the vast majority of situations in our life day to day, how God would have us act is really clear. Most of the time, the problem is not knowing what God wants us to do, but actually doing it. Most of the time, the problem is not it being hard to work out the right way, but actually our unwillingness to, act, to, to walk in it, our reluctance. I am the Lord's servant, Mary says. What about you? What about me? Could we say that and be willing to live it? I am the Lord's servant. Are we willing to trust God and walk his way, even if it might mean hardship or difficulty or challenge? What about us? This baby was born over 2,000 years ago, but he has a claim on everyone's life today. He is a saviour sent by God, the saviour that we need. He's God's son, he's God's king. He has a claim on you and me. How will we respond to him? How will we keep responding to him? For we say to him and to his heavenly father, I am the Lord's servant. Will we quietly ignore him at least some of the time? We read, didn't we? He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David 
and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Let's pray, shall we? Father God, we thank you so much for this uh, announcement of Mary, of your great Saviour, of your own Son coming. That great promised King coming to reign over your people. Lord, we pray that we'll trust and believe and embrace these things. Lord, we pray that we'll believe them not only in our minds, but live them out in our hearts and lives and attitudes. Lord, we thank you for Mary's willingness to do what you said and to live uh, the way that you'd, you'd called her to. Lord, we pray that we might have that same willingness of heart to walk your way, even when it's difficult or challenging even when there might be suffering or hardship. Lord, we pray this morning that we might be those who trust these words and are willing to respond with Mary, I am the Lord's servant. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Michael. In that passage, we heard about how wonderful this was that Jesus was coming to earth, the virgin birth. And we're going to finish by singing. It is a thing most wonderful, <clears throat> almost too wonderful to be, that God's own son should come to earth. And the wonderful thing is to save a wretch like me. So let's stand to sing.
Him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>